and uh, I'm John Best from the organizing team. Some of you will know me, um, and uh, you're going in a little while to hear uh, Rob Gifford in conversation with Russell Jones. Uh, before I do, I want to say thank you to Milton Keynes Council, who helps fund us. Um, our host today, Waterstones, who not only make the space available, uh, but they also provide the alcoholic refreshment, which really does make a difference. We try and find places that will give us free booze wherever we can. And uh, thanks particularly to all the Waterstone staff who are sitting there smiling and being extremely helpful and without whom this would not be the same event. Um, Milton Keynes Libraries and uh, Milton Keynes Community Learning uh, are both central partners to what we're doing, as is Arts Gateway, the parent organization of, of MK Litfest. So thank you to all our volunteers as well, many of whom are here. And um, I need to tell you what to do in the event of a fire. The main emergency exit is out through the front. And if that's on fire, out through the back. And if you're online and the fire breaks out, I can't help you. Uh, so the live streaming is great. Uh, there's photography happening and obviously the, the we're recording uh, the, the live stream as well. So uh, we expect that will be going up on our YouTube channel in due course. If anybody really doesn't want to be recognized and seen and and uh, with any proof that they're here at this uh, subversive event, let us know, let one of us know and find a way, we'll find a way if we can of obliterating all evidence that you're here. Uh, we may not succeed. The uh, session is going to last about 45 minutes. Uh, after that, you'll be able to ask questions of Russell. And for those who are watching online, um, you can put your questions in the chat and we will have also the opportunity of those to be relayed live to the audience here. I'm afraid our technology doesn't um, raise, rise to you actually presenting yourselves digitally and speaking to us here, but we will relay the question. Um, we hope that's going to work well. And um, after an hour, we all fall over laughing and leave. So I really look forward. The There will be book signing um, before we fall about laughing and leave. Uh, over there, Russell will be signing copies of both his books, the one you heard about last time, and one you actually also heard about last time. It wasn't published until very recently, the decade, uh, not the decade, the four chancellors and funeral. That's enough from me. So I'm delighted to welcome um, Russell Jones and Rob Gifford interviewing him. What's that? Was that us? That was us. That was clever. Um, there's, it's always wonderful walking through an audience when you're clapping, when there's a when there's a, a guide dog or a helpful dog, because when they hear clapping, they always think it's time to leave. <laughs> uh, and the dog did, but you're not. So don't clap anybody because the dog will think it's time to go uh, and you'll miss the rest and you'll miss the rest as well. So we'll make sure you don't. Um, lovely to be with you again, Russell. Uh, as John said, it was probably about a year ago that we did the first uh, chat about your other book. Um, this one, I think it's fair to say, is a little bit more serious than the oh, first one. Oh, it's got its Yeah, so it's got, <laughs> well, we'll come to those. But I was going to ask you the first question, because, and this is a quote. Um, Politics is the realm of rational debate from which national, rational, functional, stable policy can arise. <laughs> what went wrong? Well, I mean, it should be. And that, go, going back to Magna Carta, going back to ancient Athens, going back as far as you can see, that's what it was, really. The whole point was, let's stop stabbing one another and stop setting each other on fire. And we'll all sit in a room together and work out a way forward. And we do that based on evidence and a shared understanding of what the truth is and what reality is and what the problems are that face us um, and that's how it has been throughout well certainly my adult life that's, that's what, i mean whether you agree with the politicians or not that's the basis upon which everything was built um but then we got to a certain inflection point the b word um you know we got to brexit and we had senior politicians literally seeing on television that we could just stop listening to expertise and we'd, we'd had enough of people knowing what they were talking about. We're going to do it a different way. 
And uh, it enabled uh, um, whole swathes of people to stop seeking uh, a shared worldview, stop believing in a shared worldview. And it didn't really matter whether this was true or not, as long as your tribe all believed mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And everything that's happened since has had to be forced through the Brexit reality filter. You know, um, things, um, it no longer matters whether or not something is right or wrong. It matters whether it's your tribe's beliefs or not. Um, and the consequence is that we've ended up with a, a, a polity, a, you know, a, a political environment where everything just seems to be falling apart the whole time. There, there is no longer a shared sense of, unified sense of what the world is and how it operates. It now just a question of, you know, is it woke or not? Well, mm -hmm. nobody can even define what woke means. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, it, that seems to be where we end up. So what went wrong was that politicians who should have been responsible for maintaining this environment allowed it and encouraged it to disintegrate for short-term political gain. And now we're suffering the consequences. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the other thing that, that kind of runs through the book is... And, and you've, you've touched on that there. You know, it's it's my tribe against your tribe now. It's not maybe the other side has a point and could we just discuss that? Um, and I, I mean, I guess the other thing is that it's also now politics as an echo chamber. Oh, yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a fridge magnet that we've got at home, which is a quote from Mark Twain, and I can never absolutely remember it, but it's to the effect of, you know, truth has only just got its boots on when a lie is halfway around the world. Yep. Um, and it, we saw that, going back to your Brexit point, we did see that with the £350 million pounds a week on the NHS. Um, I don't know where that's gone, but anyway, never mind. That's not where, I don't know where the bus has gone either for that matter. Um, but it does seem to me that it's not merely my tribe against your tribe, but it's also my tribe must be right, and I only ever hear from my tribe because of the social media echo chamber. Am I, is that fair? I think it's fair, and uh, I hold my hand up. I suspect that I'm probably part of the problem because, you know, the, I, I, as I was saying to you before we came on stage, I doubt very much if many people are reading the Week in Tory who are diehard Tory voters. So I, I'm, we, could I, take, we could take a show of hands. I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably reinforcing a set of beliefs and, you know, a certain worldview. I tend to think, you know, I I spend a lot of time and I'm um, rigorous about my research. Uh, as anyone who's seen the first book will mm. know, the, the back third of it is just sorted. Um, and I don't know, so that, so this one is as well. There's thousands of the damn things. It takes me forever. Um, so I, I hope that I'm telling the truth about these things. But um, but it's, it's just as easy to go online and tell lies and have it repeated by a million people. And then it becomes the truth. So there's a lot of people who are very responsible who are happy to do that. And unfortunately, a lot of them are in fairly senior positions. Um, and even if it's not necessarily, you know, I'm not saying it's Michael Gove, but even if it's not Michael Gove, it's Michael Gove adjacent and Michael Gove's friends and people who Michael Gove pats on the back. And I'm not, I'm not saying it's Michael Gove. I want to make that clear. But, but if it's people that Michael Gove knows, then he's not doing a great deal to stop them. Um, and, you know, uh, and that's the same with lots of people throughout cabinet level government. And, you know, you end up with people like, you know, we end up with Lee Anderson as the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party. And now we've got the Gullis, for God's sake. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, these people are not tied to the truth in any way that you or I would recognise. And they're just let off the lead and allowed to do what they want. So, yes, of course, the, the you know, the lie is halfway to the world before the truth has got its boots. So I'm you know. There are so many lies. If I was a quote in this book, and I won't bother digging it out for you now, but it's, it's in there, um, from Boris Johnson from about 2014, 2015. Um, he actually went on television and said this, and I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's along the lines of it. I've got this fantastic new strategy, which is to say so many lies that you can no longer keep hold of them. And I just bombard the media with lies. So they never know which lie to chase. They're too busy chasing the last one. And then I'm allowed to do whatever I want because they're too busy chasing the lies and I can do what it, I can do anything. I'm free to do anything I want. Uh, and, you know, I think what I actually said, I could, I could drop my depth charges whenever I want to, which, you know, is not a great thing for a government minister to say that their, their whole plan is to lie to the country, uh, to confuse them until the point when they can no longer believe anything. Meanwhile, you're bombing the place. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that's what the prime minister said. So that's why we've got into a position where there are a group of people who are perfectly have to accept that because it's on their tribe. These are the Boris Deesters. 
and the people who are from that side of the argument. I'm not saying that all people on the right are like that, but the people who are prepared to forgive Boris everything he did because his side was winning have encouraged this. Mm. We'll come back to the, the analysis that you've done of the Conservative tribes, because I think that is interesting. But it's remiss of me, because when we were talking upstairs, I did say, shall we start with a reading from the book? No, we didn't. And we didn't, did we? <laughs> no. no. So no. shall we roll back a few moments and... I don't have to ask people have they read it because they probably even haven't haven't even had a chance to buy it yet. But I know you're going to. So Russell is now going to give you an extract. Russell. Uh, this is from the period when Boris Johnson was just about to stop being prime minister. And so Boris Johnson became the first successive prime minister to have their career destroyed by Boris Johnson. <laughs> yeah, he couldn't even get that much right. After he delivered his humility-free resignation address from the steps of Downing Street, a senior government source told journalists that speech was a fucking disgrace. You'd think his resignation would mean he'd resigned, but no, the Tories, ever sticklers for tradition, proved incapable of getting the exit done, and Johnson stayed in Downing Street, barely even pretending to leave the country anymore. He didn't bother turning up to chair three separate Cobra meetings about various crises, opting instead to throw a party for himself. He'd learned his lesson, clearly. And then it was back to cosplaying, this time dressing up as Tom Cruise to arse around in an RAF jet, like the honey monster being cast in a knockoff movie called Top Gun. <laughs> it was at this stage of the proceedings that the government chose to stage a no-confidence vote in itself. Labour wanted a confidence vote to shift Johnson out of Downing Street as fast as possible, so somebody, anybody, could start addressing the cost of living crisis. But Johnson really didn't care about that. He just wanted to save his skin for another few hours and decried the entire thing as a deep state plot to reverse Brexit. Yet the only way he could avoid judgment on his own leadership was to call a confidence vote on the entire government instead. They won because not even they would be stupid enough to bring down their own government while they were 20%, 20 points behind in the polls. Even so, they couldn't get through the process without a fiasco. Tobias Elwood, the chair of the Commons Defence Committee, was stripped of the Conservative whip and made to sit as an independent MP because he'd missed the vote. He'd been in Moldova before heading to the front line in Ukraine as part of his task of promoting the Prime Minister's efforts there and couldn't make it back because of travel chaos overseen by Dominic Raab. So they effectively sacked him for being the last minister in the country still doing his job. <laughs> for the rest of the Tories, it was time to begin the first leadership election of the year. Their top priority was to urgently find a new PM who could prove to the nation that the squalid Boris Johnson was an exception to the norm. Quick and clean, that was what was needed. This doesn't entirely explain why the party decided the leadership campaign should deprive Britain of the functioning government for an epic eight weeks, longer than practically any modern general election. And as for clean, more than one candidate immediately beat dossiers, listing the seediness of their rivals. Details included the, list, the use of hard drugs, prostitutes, tax dodges, illegal loans, and what one Tory source described as explicit photographs that could be used for compromise. None of this boded well, but then the boding got worse after a perfectly ludicrous 14 candidates threw their hat into the ring, or 11 if you only count Grant Shapps once. <laughs> Under party rules, in order to stand, the candidate needed nominations from only eight MPs, but Ben Wallace, who'd been favourite just days earlier, couldn't even scrabble together that many, so decided to sim simultaneously remain our defence minister and a life model for ornamental rubber doorstops. And so the competition began. Enter the Dunderdome. <clears throat> the pantheon of non notary began with Lewis Truss, dragged away from Instagram long enough to fill in the application form to become MP. Truss gained widespread support from the usual suspects, Jacob Rees-Mogg, Jonathan Gullis, Mark Francois, and Daniel Kaczynski. Catalogue models for the extremes of the human form, and entirely unconcerned that Truss emitted the energy of Philomena Kung trying to understand the offside rule. She was what they wanted, and don't let them forget it. Truss's response to the massive unpopularity of Boris Johnson was to first design, define herself as the Boris Johnson continuity candidate, and then to deny she was the Boris, Boris Johnson continuity candidate at all, heavily foreshadowing the stability and fortitude that became her trademark. <laughs> Some people boast they are single-minded, but Trussie's dedication to efficiency had got her down to a lot less than that. 
By stark contrast, Jeremy Hunt's pitch was that he was the caring, intelligent, and competent candidate, a claim only slightly undermined by the fact that he couldn't remember the nationality of his own wife. <laughs> It's certainly true that he was the least fish chewingly right wing major candidate, predominantly by keeping his absolutely horrible political views static, while the rest of the party goosed off, goose stepped off to find even horrible ones. In normal circumstances, a candidate for PM being technically sane would be an advantage. Not so with this less electorate, which consisted almost entirely of furious 80 year olds from Guildford who early to believe they were living in the movie Zulu. This reduced the technically moderate Hunt's chances of victory to practically zero. To so to increase his appeal, he selected Esther McVeigh as his running mate and described her as a star. Perhaps the star he meant was a white dwarf, which physicists will tell you is incredibly dense, produces absolutely no material of worth and rapidly collapses. <laughs> the other big hitter was Rishi Sunak, standing to become prime minister so he would overturn the economic legacy of Rishi Sunak. Most people's gut reaction was this. That can't be our next Prime Minister. He looks like he's barely out of short trousers. <laughs> and then the camera panned down, and you realised he was barely in them. Every ensemble ended mid, mid shin, as if he's ordered a range of vastly expensive business suits that came with Capri pants. Regardless, his campaign got off with a blistering start, with a fellow MP describing him as a treacherous bastard. <laughs> and the nation reminding him that we weren't thrilled at the prospect of replacing the guy who was fine for illegally partying with the other guy who was fine to live about him. Sunak quickly flipped through the role of X of things a man with no beliefs can claim and plucked out the card labelled honesty candidate. Unfortunately, this didn't entirely square with the subterfuge surrounding his family's tax affairs. So his next idea was to proclaim himself a serious candidate for a serious time. Fat chance. We also remembered him as the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who didn't know how to use a credit card at the garage where he'd taken the key Rio he pretended to drive. Days into his campaign and with two false starts already under his tiny, tiny belt, Sunak then told fellow MPs that his only weakness was striving too hard for perfection before appearing in front of a ready for Rishi campaign banner on which he'd misspelled the word campaign. <laughs> so it does remain funny as well as serious. Mm. Just in case you were thinking, my God, it's going to be several hundred pages, or you know, I am, I'm going to throw myself under a train. There's only two pages like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to ask you the other one. Now, this may require you to flick through the book very quickly, but you do give us a number of anagrams of conservative politicians, <laughs> um, some of which are suitable for a public audience. <laughs> Um, some of which are less suitable, so and some of which certainly shouldn't be live streamed. <laughs> um, but I wonder if you can remember what any of them are without having to flick, flick through the book. Uh, Nadine Doris is in name disorder. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth Tross is haziest bluster. And uh, Alexander the Fethel Boris Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> It's xenophobe slander offends off jail. <laughs> so, you know, when you come to cast your vote, <laughs> please remember those choices. Um, you, you've already touched on the one who appears to be the survivor of all these 14 years of one, two, three, I don't know, six conservative comes oh, and that's Michael Gove. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? I know. Yeah. So what is it about Gove? Well, you know, I, um, I'm not going to tell you who they are, but there are three conservative MPs who contact me directly, um, and it's on, it's on pain of death, so I, I honestly, I'm not going to give you even a hint about who these people are, but they are from the moderate, the people that Ken Clark would recognise as conservative MPs, they're from that area of the party. And uh, there are no direct quotes from the book because the lawyers wouldn't let me put them in there because I had to prove and I found myself trapped in a, in a confidentiality loop. Um, but they tell me that the, the, the stories within, the par within Parliament are that Gove is actually reasonably competent run at running a department, which is why he keeps being given departments to run. What he attempts to do on the whole, everybody thinks he's appalling, but he's reasonably competent at doing it. <laughs> And, and this differentiates him from yeah. lots of his colleagues. <laughs> but um, 
with the exception of Sunak, he's now been fired by every single one of the people he's worked for. Every single prime minister he's worked for has fired him. I mean, even when Boris Johnson, when 168 ministers and trade envoys resigned in 24 hours in order to force Johnson out, when Gove went to see Johnson and told him it's time to go, Johnson sacked Gove. He, <laughs> he even managed to get sacked while everyone else was resigning. You know, it's like, it's like, well, I've only got this one chance to do it, so I might as well. I, why, why has he survived? I think he's an extremely wily political operator. He's got a reputation for being very, very polite to people. So he, does, he hasn't made that many enemies within Parliament, mm. I don't think. I mean, this is damning by fake praise. He's reasonably polite and he's not as incompetent as the rest. <laughs> so he's, he's safe. And he's, he's a very good dancer. Yeah. He has his moves. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly in, in discos. In, 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 in jungle, jungle music in Aberdeen nightclubs. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We shouldn't yeah. forget that that's a very critical and important qualification. It's, it's my understanding right. that he was trying to connect with the youth vote, and I think I think he's good at that. I've long argued that the Conservative vote, the Conservative Party, needed euthanising. <laughs> <laughs> um, your other your other description, which I think is is memorable, um, uh, it's just depressingly memorable, actually. Um, <laughs> Not the, the quotation is not depressing, but the thought is depressing. Uh, Johnson's government is cruel, sleazy, spoilt, and chaotic. Um, but you also say that the British public might have put up with three of those, but couldn't take all four. Yeah, we have in the past. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, I mean, in the recent past as well. I mean, if you look back at, you know, the Thatcher government. Um, it, it's often held up as an example of what a government should be, and I wish people would stop doing this for the Labour Party. Uh, uh, you know, they achieve things. So did Pol Pot. You know, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's not necessarily a great thing to say they achieve things. They made a, a, a big difference to the country. But most of the things that the Thatcher government did to the country have turned out to be they've poisoned the well. Um, and the idea that we should still hold Thatcher up as an example because she was a strong leader, uh, I, I just don't buy it. But um, she was cruel, and the country put up with it for a very long time. Um, and the major government, you know, we, he was surrounded knee deep in sleeves. Not him personally. Mm -hmm. not, I mean, I, I actually have quite a lot of time for majors. That, you know, looking back now, when, whenever John Major stands up, you look and think, "Wow, the, there are still some sane, competent, conservative uh, MPs floating around, mm -hmm. or, or former MPs." Um, and he appears to have kept a, have a, a moral centre about him, which is sorely lacking in much of what we see around us now. But his entire party was neck deep mm. in sleeves for almost the entire time they were in office, and the, the government put up with that. Uh, you know, the, the government, ha the, Cameron's ministry was extremely spoiled. He had no idea of the effects of his policies on the 99% of the public. He didn't live in bucolic luxury in the middle of Surrey or whatever it is, he's from Wiltshire or whatever. You know, um, it, so the country is prepared to put up with all those things, but if you get all of them together and then you add chaos as well, you know, that's too much for us. We'll put up with a lot, but not that. No. Yeah, yeah. What does it say, though, British? We'll put up with great hardships and not minor inconveniences. <laughs> I think this is true. Well, I think we certainly, we certainly, may, have, we certainly may have had that. I mean, after the chaos of Johnson and Truss, um, is Sunak an improvement? And I think there's there's two strands to answering this question. There is, is Sunak an improvement for the country? Or is Sunak, and or, is Sunak an improvement for a writer? Uh, uh, <laughs> I didn't add that in my question earlier, but I was just thinking about know, it beforehand. For, for a writer, I would still have Liz Truss in charge. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just the gift that keeps on giving. Um, <laughs> Sod the contra. Um, is Sunak an improvement? I think Sunak gives a, a studied impression of plastic managerialism that is uh, uh, um, made us originally think that he was more competent, made us originally think that he had more vision, more spine, more certainty, more direction. But, you know, if you look at what he's achieved in the last two years, well, there's a couple of things. First of all, he's got absolutely shocking political judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, almost everybody that he appointed to his first cabinet was almost immediately overwhelmed with sleeves. And uh, almost all the problems that they were brought down by, 
had been known about for months or years. It's reported in the book. I mean, Dominic Raab's um, bullying inquiries went back to 2014. You know, it's not like these things are secret. Well, you know, the, uh, there's a quote from somebody, I think it was Nick Robinson, who said that the dogs on the streets around Downing Street knew all about Gary Williamson. Um, and he lasted 14 days in office before it overwhelmed him. And you look at Suella Bradman, who he, he only appointed to keep the right of the party on side. And then when she went, well, let's have Lee Anderson. Um, he's gone and it will be Gullis soon mm. as well. You, you know, you can you can take that to the bank. I, I can almost guarantee that Gullis will collapse under some kind of scandal and then turn to reform. I can almost guarantee it because he's, he's just... That's just who he is at a fundamental level. Um, so soon has got lousy political judgment. He's got lousy judgment in terms of who he appoints. He's got lousy judgment, lousy sense of politics. You know, all the business with his largest donor who uh, who was um, um, saying some pretty appalling and racist and, mm. and, 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 and sexist things. Um, Mr. Hester. Yeah, Mr. Hester. Hester, yeah. Um, you know, a, a, a wily politician would have, would have said it's 50 million quid it's going to cost a lot of money but we need to show strength here mm. and we need to have some sense of leadership and he didn't it's just he's, he's an invertebrate of a man really he's just you know completely spineless um so is he better no i don't think he is i think part of the problem is that because he doesn't offend quite as much as everybody else it's allowing this to drag on and if you look at the last year there have been no well, what are the policies that there's the, the policies are rwanda um, and you know what I saw, um, and actually this is going out live, so I'm going to caveat the hell out of this. This is not absolutely proven yet at all. I'm currently in the middle of researching this because I, I need to back it up because I'm writing another book at the moment and this will end up in there. But I saw some research recently that said that 60% of Conservative members agree with Hester about, is, about Islam. That 60% of them are Islamophobic, which is a really high number. It's appalling. Um, and at the same time, I saw some separate research that said that the most popular conservative policy among conservative members is the Rwanda policy, which is supported by 34% of conservative members. That's the most popular policy they've got. So it's not unreasonable to say, if, if these are true, and it's a caveat, if they're true, it's not unreasonable to say that the thing that holds the conservatives together more than anything else is, is racism. Mm -hmm. um, because that is twice as popular. Racism in the Tory party is twice as popular as their most popular policy. The only thing holding together is, is really pretty regressive views about race. So Sunak was unable to go out and say anything about Hester because that's 60% of his vote. That's the thing that holds them together. If he said something about it, they'd all dash off to Reform UK. Um, so the fact that Sunak's there looking like is, is less immediately offensive than Johnson, he's less immediately obviously a human hand grenade than trust was and it's just allowed it to drag on and on and on and on when well, it should have collapsed a year and a half ago it should have ended with mm. cross there's no way this government's got any reason to be in power anymore mm. and it's also it seems to me a government that and politics in general now are almost beyond satire you know you you mm. you you rightly are very scathing and very humorously scathing about the incompetence, the sleaze, the mismanagement that we've had over the last five, ten years. But at the same time, we've now got to a point where it's got so bad that you almost can't even laugh at it, it seems to me. Well, I, I bumped into, um, it's about a year ago now, I was, I was at a the literary festival in, in Totnes, and I bumped into um, Otto English, who I don't know if, if you're aware of Otto English, a very good writer. Um, very tall man as well. <laughs> Standing next to him, I felt like I was at the bottom of a well. Um, and I, I was chatting with him, and he, he, was, he was saying, you know, it, it was very complimentary about the Week in Tory, um, which I do on Twitter. And he said, the thing is, when you read it, it sounds like satire, but then you realise it isn't. It's literally just a list of things that they've done. And he said, he said you, you've, you've found your way into doing something remarkable here, which is yeah. you've managed to write satire without it being satirical in any way at all. <laughs> Uh, I don't think you need to be satirical. I think you literally just need to say these are the things that they've done. Mm -hmm. They are auto satirical. They are satirizing themselves as they go along. It's, it's, to, in a sense, it's a dream for a writer. It's, mm -hmm. you, you don't have to think up anything new. It's all right there. <laughs>
that is, that's even that's an even more depressing. <laughs> I mean, at times it felt like a very, very out of control Roman emperor's court. Yes. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. And this is a dangerous one when you've got, you know, a classicist ex prime minister or an ex classicist ex prime minister or any version of that in, in Johnson. But you did. I did feel reading it, you know, I, I, I cannot believe all the dreadful things that have happened over the last few years and that it's just you know just been allowed almost the sleazy caesar yes yeah, he's um you know he, he seems to want to live the life of the roman empire uh, emperor he's you know he's 800 pounds of old gold wallpaper on downing street flat you know and, and his excuse was, it was to preserve the dignity of the downing street have you seen lulu little's contributions to design standards <laughs> this is con this is preserving the dignity of downing street they're appalling. You look like somebody's tried to make a physical rendition of a neural album, I think. I thought it's ridiculous. So, yeah, um, the man had, uh, did not possess normal taste, normal limits, normal anything, really. He's, um, he's an aberration, really, from normal behaviour in almost every way you can think of. And he has been for 30 years, really, 30, 35 years that he's been in the public eye. And it astonishes me to this day that he was allowed to get so far. It's, it's such a... a an awful condemnation of the Conservative Party as a whole, because you have to remember it's not it's not like he got there without any help from anybody else. He got there because his local Conservative Association was prepared to overlook everything he'd done, and then he became a, uh, an MP because his voters were prepared to over, overlook everything he'd done, and he became a minister because other prime ministers were prepared to overlook everything he'd done, and he got a job at the Telegraph and he got a job at the Spectator because. The owners of those things were prepared to overlook everything he'd done. And it's not like nobody knew. Mm. And became prime minister and was supported by, you know, not all, but enough of his, his MPs and, of course, their associations as well. He, he was one man, but the man, he was, a, he was not an aberration. He was a culmination of all, all these things that happened around him. He was the tip of the pyramid. Mm. And every single person in that pyramid needs to look themselves mm. and say, yep, I was part of it. Mm. I, I got in there. I did that. All these things that he did, I have some responsibility for that mm. because they do. Mm. You know, they, they all had an opportunity to put their foot down and say, no, we're not going to do it. And far too few of them did it. I won't say no, because there were several, lots of Tory MPs who knew exactly who he was and rebelled. Mm. But they were all kicked out of the party by mm. the people who mm. were prepared to accept it. Yeah, somebody who popped up on the radio actually on The World at One today was Dominic Grieve, and I put him in that category. Yeah, absolutely. He's a, he's a man who um, I think put the good of the country above his own career and above his own party and above his own everything. And um, I don't agree with Grieve on a, a great many policies, I have to be honest. If you if you read his, his political agenda, it's not one that coincides with mine very strongly. But I've got a lot of time for the man because he, he was prepared to sacrifice his career and his money and his reputation within the party that he dedicated 40 years of his life to, he's prepared to throw all that away to make a, a moral stand. And fair play to the man. Mm -hmm. that, and that does lead me to the, the other, I think, very I mean, there's lots of serious bits in the book, but there's a, there's a very interesting point you make about it being a governing party, but it's also its own opposition. Because, and, and you keep hearing this, you know, they pop up and they say, well, it's all been going wrong for the last 14 years. And you think, well, hang on, when have you been in charge? <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but there's also an interesting point you make, which I think comes out of that, which is that the Conservative Party is actually a very broad coalition. Yeah, it is. Uh, and I mean, they make announcements about this kind of thing all the time. They've got this idea of, you know, the, the five families that they announced, the, the people on the right announced recently, who are, you know, the, the the right wing groupings, the popular the popular conservatives led by Liz Truss. <laughs> you see what I mean about satire? Who needs satire? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, um, so you know we have all these groupings, in it, and you've got the the old fashioned Shire Tories who still exist around Wiltshire, who probably after the next election will be the majority of the party because they're the ones with the safest seats. Um, the, these are the people who have got a lifelong commitment to you know red trousers and double bore shotguns. <laughs> I apologise to any red trouser wearers in the audience. You know, they're all barber jackets and Land Rovers and, and uh, Women's Institute. And uh, that's sort of the, a very traditional part of the Conservative Party. So you've got a lot of the MPs are still that. But then you've got the Red Walter Tories, who are a bunch of... <laughs> I don't even know how to describe them. 
they, they seem to have joined the part. You know, they joined a the party that's committed to getting rid of the taxation, and all they can do is we have more tax, so we can spend it on our local. They want tax and spending exactly the same way Labour do, but they just don't like foreigners, and that's really <laughs> what it comes down to. That's that's basically what it comes down to. You know that they're they're. they're you know, Lee Anderson was not just a member of the Labour Party, he was a member of Militant. He was a member of the Militant tendency. You know, and, and now look where he is. You know, and it's all driven by essentially one thing, which is, you know, he doesn't like seeing people from other cultures in his local Tesco. Um, and, uh, you know, you've got all these different fragments within the Tory party, and each one of them blames the other for whatever today's chaos or today's disaster is. It wasn't us, it was them. They did that. And then... Ten minutes later, they're blaming the other faction over there. The other faction's blaming them. And it's allowed the party to think that they're not responsible for anything that's happened in their name. Um, and all they do is argue among one another about who's to blame for the latest cock-up or what we should do differently. No, we don't need that prime minister. We need another one. Either. But honestly, the, I think the best thing that could happen to the Conservative Party after the next election, if we, if we get rid of first past the post and we introduce proportional representation and they're allowed to divorce one another <laughs> and, and become a series of smaller parties that get only the votes that they want to, and they no longer have to be trapped in this toxic relationship with the people that they're supposed to be on the same bench as us. I have a feeling it could be a very expensive divorce. A very interesting divorce. I'm not paying for it. No. Um, <laughs> but no, and if they're not in power, we won't be paying for it either. No, no. That's the trouble is we have been paying for it. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, I think that's probably enough of me doing the questioning. Um, just to remind the viewers at home, so to speak, um, if you want to submit a question via the chat function, you can, and we will pick it up. Um, but does anybody in the audience have a question or a contribution they want? As I expected, lots of hands coming up. So there's a lady there, and then Maya will be next over here in the stripe top. Right. Um, have you a few ideas in your back pocket for the wonderful day when this lot are no longer in power and Labour are? Of what I'm going to do, what the country. Well, uh, and in, um, how are we going to make that funny? Because it's very, oh, well, very serious. serious. You know, um, I, I have been asked a few times. I'm not going to start doing the week in Labour. Um, possibly, my heart wouldn't necessarily be in it. But, but uh, I also think that it's important that a government is held to account. And after the next election, if the polls are right, there's not going to be really a very effective opposition party left. It's got to be responsibility of people like, you know, I, I, I'm, there's no way on earth I ever wanted to be sat on this chair holding a microphone. Uh, this, this, is, this is not my grand plan. I've got no intention of being a leader of anything, really. I just want to disappear into the background. But uh, the likes of me and Carol Balderman and all the, you know, the, the Otto English and not, that group of people on, who are sort of the big shouty people on Twitter who go on about the governments all the time. Uh, we, I don't think we should shut up. I think we should hold Labour's feet to the fire because uh, a government without opposition is a lazy government. And I don't care whether they're the left or right. You need a good opposition to hold people to account. And if the Tories are, end up with 95 seats, as some polls are suggesting, they, won't, they literally won't have enough members of parliament to occupy their place on every select committee. They might be the largest, second largest party, which means they'll be official opposition, but they won't be big enough to actually do the job. Um, and unless they start making unofficial arrangements with the Lib Dems and the SNP and whoever else, uh, the smaller parties, I don't see how there's going to be a really effective, strong opposition in Parliament. So somebody somewhere needs to start holding Labour's feet to the fire. I don't think it'll be me. I quite, I've got a novel that I'm writing, so I'd quite like to just get on with that and forget, forget about politics for a couple of years. Um, um, but yeah, uh, but as far as uh, what, what happens to the country, I think that's a much more important question. And I think that's uh, my feeling is that we definitely need a strong government with a sense of direction. My worry is that Labour's Ming Vars strategy, that they're walking around the place towards the election as if they're holding a Ming Vars in arms, taking no risks and doing no anything. My worry is that even if they get into power and they suddenly say, no, actually, we've got all these really bold policies for how we want to tackle the country and we need bold policies. The, my worry is that they will be told that they don't have a, a, a mandate for these things because they never mentioned them before the election. And that even though they might have a 400 MPs in the House, they find it difficult to do anything because they hadn't made enough indication of what they were trying to do before the vote was cast. Um, if it was up to me, I think Labour 
can afford to be much bolder. And I think that they can afford to risk not winning 20, 25, 30 seats because their majority is so much guaranteed. They can afford to risk a few edgy marginal seats that they may or may not win. They could afford to lose a few in order to get enough good policies to make a really serious change to the way this country is operating because we need it. It's it's also the case, I think, going back to 1997, you know, when there were that many MPs in the governing party, there wasn't much for the MPs to do either in the governing party. Yeah. Um, so they all got told to go back to their constituencies and effectively be social workers yeah. rather than MPs. There's a lady here. Yeah, my, my question was uh, also about the next, Labour, hopefully, Labour government. But I was wondering, do you think they are they can hold it together as well? Because they're not always united. And will they be uh, sort of have more of a, a moral compass? And how will they have the money to do so? Because the Tories have nicked an awful lot of their ideas. Well, uh, the three questions there. What, so let's start with... <laughs> I'll, I'll try and solve them. So, so the, the moral thing, um, I don't think that there could be a lot more immoral than the government we have at the moment, but they have made, in my opinion, moral mistakes in, the, in recent months, particularly around what's happening in Israel and Gaza. I think that they've... Um, it's a very sensitive subject, obviously. It's one that's going to be very divisive. But I think that any moral authority that Israel had has been squandered. And I think that Labour have, by continuing to hold the position they do, and I can understand why they hold the position they do, but by continuing to do that, they're losing some of their own moral authority, the Labour Party have. In terms of money after the election, no, we're not going to have any money. Uh, the country's, it's not going to be like it was in 97 when Labour came in at the point when the economy was starting to rise again and we could actually start spending money on things that needed to be spent. It's not going to happen. Uh, I think Labour needs to do a couple of things. One is they need to rejoin the customs union and the single market. I think it's going to be vanishingly difficult, almost impossible to get back into the EU as a political entity in the next 10 years. I think it's going to be a, a non-starter. But joining the currency union will give a 4 to 5% boost to the economy almost immediately. Um, and God knows we need that money. The other thing they should do, I think, is a wealth tax. There's, a, there's a, an ethical millionaires group that's found, mm -hmm. has been founded, which is going around the place saying, please, for God's sake, tax us. Tax us an extra 10%. The leader of it, I think he said he earned £29 million last year, and he said he ordered his his, um, his accountants to do nothing to avoid tax, pay all the taxes that he, that he could. And the accountants came back and told him that if he wanted to, he could pay less than £100,000 tax on his £29 million. Um, if he wanted to, entirely legally. Um, you know, the, the, the recent stamp down, the crackdown that the um, Tory party had on non-DOMs, we're going to stop non-DOMs, the Sunak family alone can save three hundred and twenty-five million pound in tax under that crack that crackdown. Is it possible to use sarcastic <laughs> air quotes? Sarcastic air quote crackdown. Three hundred three hundred million pound from one family. And if you actually start doing the maths on that, that's the entire tax contribution of about six thousand workers. That's the entire six thousand people who are doing all that work and paying all that tax it's for absolutely nothing, so that they can heat their swimming pool a little bit more. Uh, and you know go back to morality that that's fundamentally immoral so i think labor needs to do actually close those things down it needs to actually start doing wealth taxes it needs to start uh, if it was me i would also do a revaluation of all council taxes they haven't been revaluated so it's about 94 no. 94 i think it was the last time they revaluated uh you know lots of people in the country are paying far too much council tax because their their the value of their homes hasn't gone up but the value of the council tax has Lots of people's, the value of their houses have gone through the roof, but their council taxes remain where it is. It's unbelievably unfair, and it's robbing local councils and local democracy of the money they need to survive. You know, look at places like Birmingham, who just had to cut 100% of their arts and social funding. And you've got councils all over the country that are on the brink of collapse. And it's not just a question of arts funding, you know, which is important, but not everything. But you've got, you know, they, they can't afford to run nurseries, they can't afford to run social care. There are lots of things that need to be done to get money. It isn't all about raising tax by, you know, adding 1% to income tax or anything like that. It's about restructuring the tax system that we have now so that people who are floating around in oceans of unearned money start putting back in. And there are lots of people who are very wealthy who support this as well. It's, it's not just poor people like me saying, come on, cough up. 
lots of wealth, lots of rich people there as well. I think it's that. Ah, oh, there's a gentleman at the back. There we go. Hello. 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 Sorry, I wanted to ask you if there's anything in the book about the special advisors. They're my particular hate group. <laughs> <laughs> Dominic Cummings, in particular. Uh, well, Dominic Cummings is mentioned quite a lot. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there is quite a bit of coverage of Dominic Cummings. Um, my favourite Dominic Cummings story is that when he was still at Oxford, he was studying PPE. He tried to get in with a, a group of wealthy friends who were um, wealthy and influential because he wanted to manoeuvre his way into the corridors of power more easily. So he made friends with them all, and he, he, at his own expense, he took them all for a day out to Alton Towers. And while he was there, he was attacked by a squirrel that jumped at him from a bin. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've got I've got no idea if that um, if, if it passed any girl was biting you, but it explains his <laughs> his uh, nutty contributions to public life. Yeah. <laughs> But yes, there is there is quite a bit about special advisors, and there will be more. I'm writing uh, another book at the moment, which is covering the, the second half of last year and this year, up to the election, and probably a month or two beyond, just to cover the fallout. And that's gonna we're gonna get that published as quickly as we possibly can after the election. But there's all, quite a lot in that about special advisors as well. So, I think um, there's a question from online. Question from online from Dave. How far do you think that journalism has enabled much of what has happened? And how do we revive the idea of scrutinising investigative journalism? Has the advent of online commentary atomised it to the extent that it won't return to mainstream media output? Uh, hello, Dave. Uh, answer to your last question is yes, it has atomised it to the extent that it won't return. I mean, the, the, some things that the internet has broken irre irrevocably. Um, I had an idea, and I, I don't necessarily think this is the best idea in the world, <laughs> but I'm going to say it anyway. I have, look, just in general, I, I have this, this policy that I have, that if I have an idea about what we could do about politics, I say, look, this might not be the best idea, but I'm going to say it anyway. And if anyone's got a better idea, don't criticise mine. Say yours instead. And then eventually the best idea will win. So, you know, my idea might not be great, but this is it. So we had the Leveson inquiry, Leveson part one, Leveson part two was cancelled, but I think they made a really big mistake. I think the way that we handle um, journalism in this country is like this. If you make money out of journalism, if you're a journalist or an editor or an owner, you have to have a license. In the same way that a doctor has to have a license. And just as a doctor has, uh, the first thing you see, do, do no harm. That's the first fourth call. First, do no harm. If you do harm, you lose your license. It can be suspended, it can be taken away forever. If a journalist does harm, they can stop the damage their livelihood. The editors have edited and approved everything they've written, so they can also be, have their license taken away. Ultimate sanction, the owners can have their license taken away. The company is taken into publish ownership and resold. So how do we determine how harm is done? Well, you don't want politicians doing it, for God's sake, under those circumstances. So the second idea, idea I had was this. Um, in Ireland, when they were having the abortion um, referendum two years ago, um, they put together what was called the People's Assembly, and they gathered, completely at random, but with demographically accurate choices, they gathered the 300 people together, and they put them in a room with a bunch of experts, and they got them to decide what the correct policy was over abortion. And that was the question that was put to the population. That was the recommendation that was put out. These people were didn't follow party line, they weren't whipped, they weren't told what to do, they just listened to experts, they had a presentation of experts, they spent a week in a room and they came out and said, this is what we should do. And it removed the possibility of politicians using these things for their own ends. It, it's, it's not full-scale referendum, which is open to too much abuse. It's a secret process, just like a jury service is. And if you trust juries, you should trust these as well. It's worked all over the world. So everybody who, work, who makes money out of journalism has to have a license. If, for example, the Telegraph broke the law when they revealed the expenses scandal, I would argue there's a perfectly good justification for that, that they might have broken the law, but it was justified. So in that instance, it would go to a citizens' assembly, 300 people, and they would look at it and they would say, I would argue, they might have broken the law, but it was justified. So those journalists get to keep their license. Whereas if you're hacking the phones of murdered children, there's no justification whatsoever in that, lose your license. The editors publish it, lose the license. Ultimately, it's part of a corporate culture, lose the license. The whole body is taken into public ownership and put on sale and sold again. And if we did that, we could actually get clean journalism in this country. We could actually get something that, that gets rid of all the problems that we've had. Many of the problems we've had in politics come from the fact that journalists are not holding people to account properly. And 
many of the others are the fact that <clears throat> Gove, Boris Johnson, these are journalists. They're basically, they're basically me. You don't want me to be in charge of anything. I'm useless. I am absolutely, don't put me in charge of anything. But they're basically people who used to be able to do a good turn of phrase mm. in 600 pages on the Telegraph on a Sunday morning. And they didn't care whether it was true or not. They had no responsibility other than the byline. And, you know, here's 250,000 quid for writing, you know, half a page of bullshit every Sunday, Boris Johnson. So he did, and then he became Prime Minister and just carried on doing exactly the same practices. So the journalists should not be in charge of things and should certainly not be in charge of governing themselves. It should go down to, a, I think, a people's assembly who should have the ability to remove their livelihoods from them if they misbehave. If you don't like that idea, and I, I can see a thousand problems with it, but if you don't like it, please come up with a better one. All right, there's a challenge to us all. Have we got have, um, any? Have we got any more flora from online? No. No. Let's let's take that one as well. Well, I have I have one from Sarah. Why you think the Tory Party have become such an omni shambles? What do you attribute the current state of the party to? Uh, it goes back to what I said earlier on, which is that they simply let go of reality. They, it, 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 the truth no longer mattered to them. What mattered to them more than anything else was the acquisition of power and the, the maintenance of it. And they, they go through a policy where all, all they do basically is... I mean, if you look at, you know, a, a year or so ago, it, it's gone out of the headlines now, obviously, because it no longer matters. But when Sunak first started, he was announcing, well, we're going to have 20,000 more police to reverse the 20,000 police you just got rid of. And we're going to put money into council house to reverse the... Uh, every policy is basically, let's reverse the one we did last week. And, and they hope that if they keep doing that, then people will vote for them again and they could just keep repeating the cycle. Um, but at some point in doing this, they stopped really caring about governing the country and they stopped really caring about what the truth was and they just allowed... I, I am allowed to say that, but no, I'm not national television. And I, was, I said the F word a couple of times for the reading. But, um, you know, they just allowed bullshit to take over and they, they stopped caring what was true and what wasn't. It's just, you know... And there is a second problem as well, which I think is... Uh, endemic across all the parties, which is not enough people are party members. It, the smaller a group of people you've got, the more likelihood is that they're going to be extreme. And if you look at the members of the Conservative Party, you know, the local Tory party members, I think there was a really interesting quote from, I can't remember what his name was now, but he was a, an American pollster who was brought in to advise the Tories around about the time of their last, um, the last party conference. And he gave a speech at the party conference where he asked the members, or asked the delegates there, what do you think the average age of a member of the Conservative Party is, a Tory party member? Does anyone want to have a guess what the average age is of the Tory party member? 70s. 70s, yeah. Okay, so this is what he said. He said the average age of the member of the Tory party is dead. <laughs> because during the previous year, more of them had died than had stayed alive. I don't know. I, you can't write this stuff, it's brilliant. <laughs> but the average age is dead. So, you know, what we have is an increasingly old, increasingly narrow, increasingly extreme group of people who are selecting our MPs, and they're not doing it on the basis of how good they are, they're doing it on the basis of how much they agree with their petty grievances and nasty little ingrained annoyances about the world. And it's got nothing to do with what's happening tomorrow. It's got nothing to do with what AI is going to do to us in four years' time. It's got nothing to do with building homes for the future or what's going to happen to our kids. Or It's got to do with, well, I saw a brown person in Tesco. Uh, you know, I mean, the truth of the matter is, it, it sounds like I'm being facetious here, but if you actually have a look at the stats of what these people believe, that's it. That's what it comes down to. Uh, and they, they count it under this umbrella term, woke, and you ask them what it means, and what it means is a thing I don't like. It's got no actual meaning. It's just this term that they're all out. I mean, there was a, a, a while ago, 20 years ago, you'll, you'll remember this, I'm sure, every time you open a newspaper, you'd see political correctness called mad written there. And they said it so many times that it just became a joke, so they stopped writing it, and now they've narrowed it down to woke. But it means the same thing. It's just it's political correctness gone mad. What does that mean? I don't like it. There's a brown person over there. That's what it comes down to. You know, it's about migrants and nothing else. Um, so you've got this tiny cohort. And what worries me is if, if Labour, uh, as I saw last week, lost was it 20 something thousand members over the course of the last six months, largely if, around um, disappointment around climate policy and Gaza policy. 
And what worries me is that if Labour say, well, it doesn't matter because we've got to win power anyway, and they allow their membership to shrink as well, you're going to end up with the same thing happening there, which is end up with an increasingly small, increasingly extreme group of people choosing the MPs. And then we end up with a left-wing version of what the Tories have been. And we can't afford it. I think people get involved, basically. If, can I ask, just out of curiosity, are there any members of, I'm not going to ask which party, but are there any members of political parties in this room well, that, I mean, that's brilliant. It is, honestly. That is so much more than the average. That's that's massively more than the average, but it's still way less than half of it. It's probably less than a quarter, I think. And if you're interested in politics, just join, have a say, get involved. Because otherwise, if you're not saying it, some other lunatic is saying it. And <laughs> be that lunatic! <laughs> Well, there's a thought for those <laughs> who are at home. Um, are there any other? I've got a couple more questions, but if there's anybody from the room, yeah, gentlemen on the front row. Sorry about this. It's always at the front, the person. Yeah, yeah. Just one. There we go. I think it's because it's on camera. So. Yeah. Go ahead. Do you think there's any hope? Do you think politics can be fixed? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. How? Absolutely. <laughs> well, um, well, there's also well, actually, there's a really interesting report. I feel, oh, I, I'm such a geek. There's a really interesting report that Dominic Grieve and some of his colleagues have put together into the rescue of politics and how we can go about um, changing the political culture in this country, which only came out two or three days ago. It's a bit dry and it's a bit long, but I recommend, if you can find it online, I recommend reading it. It's public reading, and I really recommend it. We've got some superb ideas for how you can restructure politics. He's not talking about first past the post or anything like that. He's talking about the way in which the whip system work and the way in which MPs are selected and the way in which MPs are trained and have to make a, you know, for instance, one thing he suggests is they have to not just make a allegiance to the crown when they become an MP, but I'll make an allegiance to a set of standards. You, I promise that I will uphold these standards and we define what those standards are. And we have a job description for MPs, which at the moment doesn't exist. And if you start doing that, then we start thinking, and also, I would argue that what we should do is we should have a, uh, a transitional period when a new government comes in. To do it in the US, we have a vote in November, and the new government starts in January. And during that two-month period, we have a transitional team set up, and it keeps politics relatively stable. Whereas what we do is we have an election on Thursday, and 9 o'clock Friday morning, the former MPs out and the new ones in. And... Uh, it's a new cabinet and two hours from now you're doing a statement in the house on what's, what our policy is on housing to go I don't know I haven't even been briefed on it yet and that's how we that's how things work in this country but I would argue that we should have a couple of things one is a transitional period between governments and the other one is unless there's exceptional circumstances when a minister is changed they should have a two week maybe even a month long training period before they take office where they are briefed by civil servants and told what their job is and, and made to sign agreements that they're going to stick to certain standards and that they're going to tell the truth in Parliament and things like this. And if they don't, there should be really serious financial and personal consequences. I think MPs should be fined. You know, um, a friend of mine lost her job recently. And she had to go on universal credit. And she was absolutely fine, but she was talking to somebody in the office there who'd been two minutes late to a universal credit meeting and lost a universal credit for a week. Two minutes late. Um, so. Um, but you know, politicians can just talk bullshit in Parliament all day long, and the Speaker says, "Please don't lie," and he goes, oh, and he sits down, and that's the end of it. And what we should be saying is, if you lie to Parliament, we're going to take away a third of your wages. <laughs> there you go, and that would stop it dead. And the second thing I think we should get rid of all money out of politics. We should make it publicly funded. Uh, the, the idea that somebody, whether left or right, I really don't like the idea of somebody giving five million quid to the Labour Party. I just don't. If I had five million quid, I, 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 I could see a temptation. If I was a very wealthy man, I could see a temptation saying I'm going to give them some money so they can do things and likely win. But I think the idea of half a dozen wealthy people in the country having that much power and authority is it's deadly dangerous. So I, I would do that as well. But yes, I, if we do very small number of fairly reasonable changes i think that we can bring it back from where it is now and return it to it was never entirely clean but we can make it a lot cleaner than it is yeah the, your point about um them has it gone off what everybody hear me i'll shout um it's um it's an interesting point about the changeover mp because actually in 1997 Brian White was elected from Milton Keynes North, as I recall, on the Friday. He was 40 on the Saturday, 
he had to re re um, had to resign his job and take up a new job on the following Monday. Yeah. And it's a daft way of organising it. Yeah. Completely daft. Russell, I think we've got to our hour. So thank you very much. I'm going to keep the microphone at this point. No, no. There you go. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful well, talking on. to you Wait, again. Absolutely, his <laughs> absolutely wonderful talking to you again. Um, and I knew it would be more serious this time than in a sense it was last time, because we are a more serious position in, in a run up to an election period. What I hope is that some of the things that you say in this book, you will be asked to repeat on television. <laughs> <laughs> and 